Our hope this evening was to create an intimate dinner atmosphere and to have both current and future leaders meet together and to hear from a respected leader from our community. After dinner, I will formally introduce David and Joellen Oskin, uh, the namesakes for this wonderful institute. And of course, later we, we will hear from our honored guest, Joe Neubauer. I just wanted to add my own thank you to you, Joe, for all that you've done for Widener, for all that you do for our community in the greater Philadelphia area, and to making the world a better place. We're just so honored to have you here tonight. What you may not know about Joe is that Widener takes credit for four of his grandchildren's kind of because his daughter attended Widener in graduate school, met her husband here, and they now have four out of his seven grandchildren are products of Widener. So we'll accept that and <laughs> say that those are right. I thought before we have dinner, I'd give you just a brief overview of the history of the Oskin Leadership Institute and why we're here this evening. If you want to talk about the beginning of the Oskin Leadership Institute, it really began a little over 50 years ago when a young freshman cadet at Widener was dropped off by his then girlfriend, Joe Allen, at what was then called Pennsylvania Military College. And what many of you, I think everyone in the room has some sense of the history of Widener, but what many people don't uh, remember is that it used to be called Pennsylvania Military College. It was actually founded in 1821 in Delaware, and there was a former colonel uh, in the military by the name of Hyatt uh, who became the president of that institution. And at the time, at the time that we became Widener College, uh, P Pennsylvania Military College was the second oldest military institution in the United States. So it has a proud, proud history. The reason it moved north from Delaware is because the leader of the institution felt pretty strongly and was about uh, the oncoming Civil War and, of course, had abolitionist feelings. He moved us up to Chester. And for the next 100 years, Widener, and then PMC, produced an incredible number of leaders, uh, people that many people don't believe or know that graduated from the institution. So, for example, Cecil B. DeMille, the famed uh, producer and Academy Award winner, Leslie Quick, uh, who was actually in school at the same time as David, who was the founder of the brokerage firm of Quick and Riley. And of course, four-star re four retired general John Tolelli, who's on our board of trustees, who was one of the leaders in the first Gulf War, are all PMC grads. And when it became Widener in 1972, we continued our commitment to excellence. And since then, in 1979, when we became Widener University, We've accomplished and had a number of individuals who've graduated from this institution who've been successful in a variety of fields. So you might see the billboards that are out there that say over a thousand of our alums, I think it's closer to 1,300 Widener alums have the title of president or CEO. But some may not have that title, but they also are people that you need to know about or might have heard of that graduated from this institution. So for example, one of the NFL's most electrifying players of all time, Billy White Shoes Johnson, he played at Widener. A former Division I Basketball Coach of the Year six years ago, who's the head basketball coach at St. Joe's University, Phil Martelli, graduated from Widener. And I think one of the finest creative minds uh, in the industry and the former publisher of the Philadelphia Inquirer, Brian Tierney, is a law school alum. And uh, Brian, I want to thank you personally for your good work. Uh, Brian Communications has helped us put together the Widener Leadership Works campaign, which I think is just fabulous. And so we, we appreciate all that you've done and your colleagues. Today, Widener is a leading metropolitan university. We have three campuses in two states, in Pennsylvania and Delaware. We educate students from 32 nations around the world. And in recent years, we focused our mission on three key elements, academic excellence. A number of our academic programs are ranked nationally in their fields and internationally on civic engagement, and also now more recently to try to hone in on leadership development. And for that work, we've been recognized by a number of organizations. The Washington Monthly Magazine has ranked, for the last five years that they've been doing this, the top 100 national universities who do the most for the United States. Widener is in that group. Two out of the last three years, Widener has been named one of the best colleges to work for by the Chronicle of Higher Education. GI Magazine recognized the top universities who do the most for our military families, and Widener is in that group. In fact, Widener was the first university in the United States to offer a full scholarship to the children of those who were killed in action in Afghanistan or Iraq. And this is one of the true... Thank you. And in a time when we say there's no 
bipartisanship in Washington, this is a case where Widener actually steps up to the plate and might help with that in that both President Bush and President Obama have named Widener to their honor roll for community service with distinction for five consecutive years. And finally, the last two years, Newsweek magazine has identified the top 20 schools in America that have the greatest commitment to community service. And we're now in a kind of an interesting category that are called do-gooder schools. And of course, we're delighted to be in that category. So obviously, we're doing something right at Widener. We have wonderful leadership from the Board of Trustees. We have a number of board members and chairman of our board, Mr. Nick Trainer, is here this evening, who's actually a classmate of David Oskin, but they argue about who's older and who's younger all the time. But we have, a num we have an outstanding set of deans. A number of them are here tonight, an incredible faculty, and inspiring students. Widener, I think, is prepared to move to new heights, and the Oskin Leadership Institute, I believe, will help us get there. But now it's time to eat, to enjoy the company of the people at the table, and we'll start the program right after dinner. Enjoy your meal. This is a very special evening and uh, for Joellen and for our family. Uh, just wonderful to have each and every one of you here, and I'm so happy that you came. Um, Jim mentioned that uh, uh, in his introduction was uh, very glowing, and I appreciate that. But I want to tell you from the heart that uh, he is one fantastic individual, and those in the room that know him know that I am speaking the truth. We were so, so fortunate back in, well, it's got to be 10 years ago now, I guess. And he mentioned that uh, there were a number of us, uh, Nick, uh, Ronstead, others, uh, got together to try to find a, a replacement for Bob Bruce, who had left, or was leaving, and uh, retiring. And we went through a whole process, and finally we uh, uh, found Jim, and we had discussions. And Joel and I had the good pleasure of uh, flying out to Defiance, Ohio, and meeting Jim, and meeting Mary, and um, so happy to ultimately things culminated in the fact that they became the first family of Widener. And they are truly, truly wonderful people. You know and I know what's happened here in the last 10 years or so. It's been fantastic. And absolutely, I didn't know until tonight that you were a do-gooder, but uh, <laughs> that, that's good to hear. And I have to say that uh, he made some nice comments about me, but he is uh, truly a gentleman. Mary is a lovely lady, and I think it's so, so, we're so, so fortunate to have him at the, the two of them at the helm of Warden University. And so, thanks for everything that you do. And Joe, it's so great to have you here this evening. And uh, I really look forward to uh, the discussion that's going to take place here momentarily. Um, I, like a lot of people in this room, came from humble beginnings. Uh, I was born in a farmhouse uh, out in western Pennsylvania. And yes, we didn't have running water. Uh, I ended up going to uh, uh, school, high school, in a steel mill town that was uh, decaying very quickly. And I had never really left western Pennsylvania except for one trip to Harrisburg to see the state capitol, which I thought was fantastic, and I was probably about oh, 14 years of age at that time. So my first trip really out of, uh, out of that part of the world was to sh show up here at, uh, at PMC, uh, Pennsylvania Military College on an August afternoon, and I was, as Jim indicated earlier, I had a girlfriend at the time, her name was Joellen, and I'm happy to say that we've now been married for 47 years. And she and my grandmother and my mother dropped me off on the, on the macadam, the blacktop behind Old Main, and I said to myself, what am I doing here? Uh, I had no idea. And I have to say, though, that the Pennsylvania military experience, like the Widener experience today, just continues. It was fantastic. I was fortunate that I had some uh, very, very good mentors uh, within the faculty and also within the Corps of Cadets. Uh, two, uh, two gentlemen who were a year ahead of me and more or less looked after me and taught me a lot were Jack Yagan and uh, John Tlelli. Uh, and they couldn't get any better than that. And so I was fortunate, as Jim mentioned, to go off into the Army. And after spending a period of time in the Army, decided that, well, Maybe the business world might be something I would try. And I went into the business world, and again, I had opportunities, and I had a couple mentors there. 
Someone asked me earlier this evening uh, whether I did, and certainly I did. And mentors are very important. They're important to all students. They're important to everybody. And uh, they can be so, so helpful. But what I learned at PMC, and what I see here in Widener, since my association starting back again in uh, probably the middle of the 90s, is leadership has always been a foundation of this university. It's what we're about. It's always what we've been about. And so you think what's happened here under Jim's leadership in terms of civic engagement, and now you think about another leg of the stool, leadership is an underpinning, and it's there. And so for Joan and I, and for our late son David, when I first had this luncheon with Jim, and he kind of, in a, I almost swallowed my soup, I mean, I, my soup went down in a hurry. Uh, when he asked me or made some suggestions as to what we might do, but he was very candid, very straightforward, and I appreciated that, as he always has been. And I had a, shortly after that, I had a conversation with Joellen, and I had a conversation with David, and we talked about what we might do. But it's all about giving back. And David's reaction was, go for it. Because we're here to help others. I mean, that's, and I, and I think that Widener has such a rich heritage that I think what the opportunities are for the, fu for the future for students of Widener, students from other parts of the world, maybe individuals who have been more seasoned when we get into more of a, more of a development program. And I think Widener is already on the map. And I think the question is, how do we become the best leadership school in this country and conceivably in the world? It's there. We're starting slowly, but we'll get there. Joel and I made a, our first contribution uh, back in uh, the mid-90s uh, with the Stephen Ross Oskin Scholarship. And that was uh, uh, our perception that what we wanted to do is to help other people from humble beginnings, uh, in, in specifically minority students. So that has been ongoing for some period of time. It now becomes part of the Oskin Leadership Institute. But it truly has, um, it's been a great experience for Joel and I, and uh, we're pleased to say to, I, I don't know everybody in the room, but the ones I do know, you're great friends, we love you. And as we go forward here, we're gonna have this institution in great hands. Because Jim introduced uh, Dr. Arthur Schwartz here earlier, and uh, Joe and I met him about a year and a half ago up in Connecticut. He came up to visit, we had a chat. Man with, <laughs> when we speak of integrity, when we speak of uh, what he has to offer from the standpoint of courage and character and uh, uh, everything else that he, he, he speaks of, he's a little scary. Uh, he, uh, in terms of the fact that uh, uh, he's, just, he's just a wonderful man. And uh, I hear him say things, I thought, whoa. Uh, but uh, that's what we have in Arthur. You know, I, I first met Joe through, I, I consider you, Joe, one of a mentor, and over the last year we've talked a lot, and I look at David Gerard DiCarlo, who is my other mentor, who has been so supportive of me over the years, who introduced us uh, 25 years ago or so. And the thing that it's always impressed me is that uh, you don't talk about yourself, so I'm really looking forward to talking about you a little bit tonight, you know? <laughs> and um, so as Arthur started to talk about earlier tonight, I mean, so Joe is a person whose parents were born in Germany, and they leave after Kristallnacht, which must have been an unbelievably courageous decision and a, a frightful decision. And they moved to Palestine, which is now, you know, of course, now Israel, but then under British rule. And Joe, young baby Joseph, is born. And at some point, I guess you're 13 or 14 years old, and your parents think you should have an, uh, another kind of an education, a better education, and you are sent over here. And you, the English language you have is basically, you've told me, is what you knew from John Wayne movie, so you knew, yep, and <laughs> yes, ma'am. So <clears throat> what's it like to be on a boat coming into America at age 14 years of age? I mean, what, what is that like, Joe? Well, uh, you know, when you're a young kid, and when you're a young kid growing up <clears throat> in uh, 1948, Palestine became Israel, obviously, after the uh, War of Independence. And uh, things were not so great there at the time. Uh, from an economic point of view, uh, 
and you know, food stamps, food rations. Uh, so when you have an opportunity after that to come to America, you're giddy with joy and opportunity. So the land of opportunity is still there. And uh, I traveled by, you know, boat by myself uh, over here. So it's the first trip that you took overseas. And I shared a cabin with five other young adults. So the trip itself was momentous in terms of so I think we remember uh, we uh, came to Halifax, Nova Scotia at the time because we, the ship was carrying citrus also at the time. So we unloaded a shipment of, of citrus. And that's the first time I've seen snow hmm. in Halifax. It was February. It was a little cold. I only had short pants. I didn't have long pants at the time. And I discovered that people were calling from Halifax to the United States. And my uncle and aunt lived in the United States. I was going to live with them. So I said, how do you do that? I said, well, there's this thing called collect call. And those of you who remember, you can still dial a number and you can call collect. So I called collect to my aunt. And my aunt is my mother's sister. She was also German, quite frugal at the time. <laughs> and <laughs> I only found out how frugal she was a little afterwards. <laughs> when I had to pay for my own phone calls <laughs> when I lived with them. But that was an amazing experience. And I remember, so I figured out how to make phone calls and what snow was all about. And then we sailed from Halifax uh, to New York City. And then coming into New York City Harbor, uh, we came in, in at dusk and we parked outside we, we, we laid anchor there because we were going in in the morning. And I remember seeing the Statue of Liberty wow. <clears throat> uh, there and kind of looking at her in twilight. And there was a big sign I remember at the time. And with my broken English, I read E-S-S-O. I said, oh, that's Esseso. And that was the old Esso company, which hence became the Exxon company. Uh, and those were early memories. I was frightened to death, but I was excited also at the same time. And uh, that's how it all started. And as a young boy, what you're trying to do is survive. And survival in a different environment is what I had to do. I didn't have any choices. So being thrown in a different environment was retrospectively very difficult. and. It obviously forms a lot of the nightmares that I still have and a few other things that I still experience. But at the time, it was very exciting. And it was tremendous. And the joy that I felt that night has been me with me for the rest of my life in the United States. So I am probably a more rabid American than most native-born Americans uh, ever will be. So you go to high school, or you, you started in ninth grade, right? I or started in ninth grade, grade right. But High school. you had a very nice principal who said what to you? So, uh, so I come to this little town outside of Boston, and I'm the first foreign students that this high school ever had. And uh, you know, Brian mentioned that uh, I didn't know any English except one year of English in, the, in Israel taught by a German. So it, I had the slightly Germanic accent to my English. <laughs> But that was OK because I loved movies at the time, and I watched John Wayne movies. So this wonderful principal was French-Canadian by the name of Cornelius Xavier Dunn would ask me a question. I would answer, yep, nope. <laughs> and he would ask me where I learned my English, at John Wayne movies. <laughs> so the end of, I came in the middle of my freshman year. And at the end of my fr freshman year, everybody got report cards. And there's no report cards for me. So the, uh, I waited in, in my home room until everybody left, and I went to see the principal. I said, Mr. Dunn, he said, well, I've been expecting you. I said, I didn't get a report card, so what, what, what am I supposed to do? He says, well, we couldn't decide because you didn't quite pass all the courses in the freshman year, but you did very well, so we're going to take a chance on you. 
So here's, he said, here's what we'll do. We'll promote you to the sophomore year. And if you pass the sophomore year, then we will also conclude that you also pass the freshman year. That was the best deal I ever made in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and we, I did that. But you can imagine when you're a young person, you don't know from Thanksgiving, you don't know from football. Yeah. Uh, uh, you don't understand all the customs. And it's, uh, it's pretty scary uh, at the time. And as I said, at the time, you're just trying to survive. Uh, and you only hear about the people that survive, right? No matter where you are in business. You hear about entrepreneurs that did well. You hear about inventors that lived over the garage and invented something. You don't hear about the other 200 that tried to do something over the garage and never made it. Or you don't hear about entrepreneurs that risked everything they had in life and never made it. I mean, the sea just washes them over. You just hear about a few that made it. Uh, but this country continues to give opportunities to people to do wonderful things. And that's why it's important to keep the American dream going uh, for a long, long time. And then you, you go from there to Tufts, right? An, an engineering right. degree. Right. And then decide from that you're going to go well, to business school, right? Engineering, too much time. Chemical engineering, too much time in the lab. Not enough social, <laughs> not enough social time. This doesn't work. So you take economics, and I remember one time you telling me that your father said, I'm not sure about business, uh, you should stick with engineering. But you get into the University of Chicago, and you graduate from the University of Chicago, and then you meet another person who becomes a mentor to you is David Rockefeller at, at Chase Manhattan back right. then. I mean, like stumbling, not stumbling, because obviously you graduate from the University of Chicago with honors, but anyway, but stumbling is probably not the right word, but then progressing then and meeting people like that. So what is that like? So you're one of the youngest vice presidents at one point of Chase Manhattan? Well, I've been blessed that people have invested in me over a long period of time. And uh, when we help young people today, it's a little bit like David said, uh, the only thing we ask of them is that they follow through in the next generation and do the same thing for the next generation. So I was a young kid, I graduated, I got a scholarship at the University of Chicago, and graduated from there and uh, went to work for the Chase Manhattan Bank. And David Rockefeller got his PhD from the University of Chicago, uh, took an interest in me, and helped me out. And, uh, you know, I got great assignments uh, on my own. I remember going to the 17th floor of the one Chase Manhattan Plaza, uh, which is downtown, still exists at the moment, but at the time it was a very contemporary building. And those of you who remember, I mean, he had very contemporary art, you know, he had du buffets out there, which nobody understood what they were uh, at the time. Uh, he had a couple of calders there, and he had a collection of African sculpture that he and his sons collected. And uh, he really supported, at the time, uh, people from all over the world he was the internationalist. He was the public face of the institution. And there was a chief operating officer by the name of George Champion, who was the tough guy who really ran the business, you know, day to day. Uh, but uh, I learned enormously. I mean, I got an MBA from the university, but I went through another whole training program at the Chase that really prepared me uh, for a career and uh, gave me the basis of the opportunity to learn finance in a, in a macro uh, level. And uh, I attribute that, I attribute the University of Chicago and the Chase Manhattan Bank for forming the basis for a career in the last 45 years that has allowed me to do what I'm doing. Earlier, earlier, and I've heard you speak many times, and earlier David and Jim have talked about it different times, about this idea of pushing yourself out of a comfort zone into something you know, new, challenging, different. And then you go from the, the banking side into a corporation at PepsiCo. And talk about that. And well, I've, I've always, it was always adventurous, adventurous. So, you know, when you go from Israel 
to America, I mean, that's a slightly different comfort zone yeah. without your parents helping out <laughs> uh, a lot. So when I started in the banking business, and I did very well there, as Brian mentioned, I was the youngest vice president at the age of 28 at the time. Today, unless you're a managing partner at 28, you think you're a failure. Uh, but at the time, I became vice president at 28. That was a pretty big deal. Uh, but I was then on, on the corporate side, and I was a consultant. And I really wanted to do things. I really wanted to get on the inside. And that's when I left to go to PepsiCo. So I became an assistant treasurer at PepsiCo. And that was a whole different environment, because PepsiCo was already in purchase at the time, uh, which was you know, very, very lovely. And it was a corporation. So now you're in the inside of a corporation. And you find out all the things that you thought you knew as a banker uh, are nothing more than approximations of reality uh, from, uh, fr from the inside. But there's another fellow there by the name of Don Kendall, who's still alive and still I consider to be one of my great mentors. By the way, David Rockefeller is still alive as well. 93, I think. Uh, yeah, that's right. And Kendall just turned 90. Uh, overall, but I'm only 49, so it's over. <laughs> <laughs> Who uh, again takes an interest in me, and you know exposes me to a global environment because PepsiCo at the time was opening up, and he was then doing the barter deal with the with the Russians. You remember that uh, he brought Stolichnaya to the United States and bartered them uh, PepsiCo concentrate uh, at the time. And uh, again, has been a friend and a mentor and a supporter ever since. Uh, invited me to his 90th birthday party, which was thrown by the Russian ambassador because of all the stuff that he did for the Soviet Union. And again, the mark of Don Kendall was that his birthday party, four former secretaries of state of the United States show up for this birthday party uh, there. And the MC is Jim Baker, uh, his wonderful friend. So role models in life of leadership are very, very important. And role models that really take an interest in you and really support you. And the third big role model that I had is here in Philadelphia was Bill Fishman, who was one of the original founders of the old automatic retailers of America, which is what became ARA, then became Aramark. And uh, the company, interestingly enough, has only had three CEOs in its 75-year history. So longevity uh, is, again, part of culture, part of value system, part of how you build corporate characters. Uh, and you know, the joke that I have with my own team and with other people is that all the mistakes that the company has made in the last 30 years are mine. And I can't run away from them. And, uh, Look, corporate life and success is nothing more than a scorecard, right? It's just like any sports, nobody's perfect. And uh, if you have a 500 batting average, it's pretty good. <laughs> and uh, I think we've had as a team, as a management team, better than an average batting uh, score, but it's not a thousand. So if you're seeking perfection, in leadership, it doesn't exist. It's just a question of, are you making more of the right decisions than the wrong decision, and are you proactive in terms of making decisions? That's where, you know, all of us have been talking off and on tonight about, you know, Penn State and what's happening there, and I think that's a failure in leadership on a grand scale there. Forget what's right or wrong and forget who did what to whom, uh, because anytime you run a large organization, things happen, trust me. We don't, we have 250,000 people, 180,000 in the United States and 70,000 overseas that work for us, and not all of them are angels. We've got a few that are not. But the trick is, you know, when you find out about it, what do you do about it? What does the organization tolerate? What does the organization do? How does it respond? And that's what I judge organizations by, and that's what I judge leaders by uh, all the time. 
So I've been blessed to have three wonderful leaders who exemplified for me both personally and organizationally what value systems are all about. For some of the younger people in the audience, I mean, you're, you're talking about going through your comfort zone, so you go come to America, the language things, engineering, business school, banking, on push into running the Wilson Sporting Goods, Sporting Division. Goods Division of PepsiCo because you want to get operational kind of a thing, and then come here. And at one point, one of, our, one of my team dug up this, uh, this thing, I, which I hadn't seen before. Uh, uh, you say when you become CEO, it's, it says in a, new, in a Business Week article, Joe Neubauer at that time at one point voiced concerns, was he too young? And Davey Davidson, the other co-founder, says to you, hey, don't worry about it. John Kennedy was president uh, younger than you are. You'll be fine. I mean, that's kind of, uh, you know, that, that sense of just having people like that to kind of make you realize that any, they have confidence in you and anything's possible and you can do it is a, is, is a, is a mentoring thing. And so... When you look back, I've heard you talk a lot about the free enterprise system and the education system in America. And talk a little bit about free enterprise and as it you know, relates even to being on the board of Wachovia and saying, I'll be on the audit committee when nobody wants to be on an audit committee of a bank. I mean, w talk a little bit about your sense of that. Well, uh, so I said before, I'm probably more American than, than most people who were born in this country. And I think the system that we have here, by the way, the private university system that exists in the United States that is the best in the world, just look at the trade balance of foreign students coming here versus studying overseas. Forget what we do with them after we get the degree. We ship them back to compete against us, which is, from a policy, on a policy point of view, the most ridiculous thing that we do as a, as a country. But. Uh, so I was a foreign student, and I get a scholarship to go to the University of Chicago. They don't know whether I'm going to stay in this country. They don't know whether I'm going to do anything for the country. I could have gone back the next day, but they're generous enough to offer me a scholarship. And I never forgot that. And I've given back several times what they paid for me, but that's beside the point. But the American ed higher education system, forget about the, the elementary or the secondary education system, the, the higher education system is a remarkable institution, set of institutions governed by the private sector, which again does not exist in any other country. I mean, even if you think about Canada or Australia or England, which are the closest to what we have, most of the universities there are public universities. The government, whether it's the state government or the provincial government or the federal government, really supports it. So I've committed a lot of myself to support the educational system because without it, we couldn't be what we are, I couldn't be what, what I am, uh, and the free enterprise system, which again is the corporate world and David talked about it a little bit in, in, in terms of his corporate experience, and many of you here have been in corporations, is again governed by private individuals. And uh, we have a system here. Again, it's not perfect. It's not perfect at all. And you know, we have abuses of it all over the place. But 98% of it works fairly well. Uh, that has private citizens governing private individuals who have very little to gain uh, by serving on those corporate boards, despite the fact that they're paid, you know, for their, for their board services, but what they're giving up is, what they're giving the institutions is their reputation, which takes us a lifetime to build and probably two or three bad board experiences to lose. You know, how would you like to be a trustee of Penn State at the moment. I mean, it's not a happy experience, and you probably stay awake at night saying, what should I have done? What could I have done? What questions should I have asked? You know, did I overlook this? Uh, so it's important for me to serve. So when I was aboard of Wachovia at the time, and I'd 
come up through three or four previous mergers, and they asked me to serve as the chairman of the audit committee, our general counsel at Aramark spent literally two days convincing me that I shouldn't do it because I'm going to get sued and you don't know exactly what they're doing, and all of which was true, and all of which happened. But I said to him and I said to myself, I'm probably as well equipped to do this as anybody else on the board. And if I don't do it, who's going to do it? And if all of us choose not to do it, then the system is not going to continue going forward. And I did, and unfortunately, you know, the debacle of 07, 08 happened, and Wachovia got sold to Wells Fargo at the last moment. You remember all this hullabaloo about Citicorp and the control of the currency urging us to do one thing or the other. Uh, and there were six lawsuits afterwards. <coughs> the last one of them is about to be settled. Uh, and, you know, there was enough insurance. I never worried about that. But I really believe that we have to support the institutions uh, that are the basics of the American free enterprise system and the basis of the public education system uh, of the United States. And that's the important part, and that's what the rest of the world is looking to us to do. Uh, so I do a lot of that, uh, and, uh, and I give back uh, a lot. And uh, as David said, I've had uh, several expensive breakfasts and lunches uh, that <laughs> with Jim and a few other people. But the, they're really wonderful things to be able to do. I consider it personally a privilege uh, to be able to give back uh, overall. And again, demonstrate leadership. You know, you can talk a lot about leadership, but people in our organization watch what I do, not necessarily what I say. And if I have a bad day as a leader, I really have to watch myself because I'm, if I'm cross with somebody because I, had a tooth, I have a toothache or I ate something bad for breakfast, I can't express that because they take it personally. And you cannot separate when you're a leader of a large group or a large, what I would call an enterprise. I forget whether it's a university or a hospital jack, or a military unit, or a business. People look at you as the leader. You're also a person. But when you're in the workplace, or sometimes even outside the workplace, people look at you all the time as a leader. So that's a responsibility that you take on when you take on a leadership position. If you don't like it, or if you don't want to do it, you can't be a leader. So leadership is a 24 by 7, in my opinion, responsibility that you have to take on all the time. Talk about 2001, you, the largest acquisition of the company is ServiceMaster, right? I mean, at that time at least, right? Yeah. Uh, 9 11 occurs. You're, a lot of personal things going on. They're, they're going to go public. Talk about that period of time in the company. Well, we, we took the company private back in 1984. Uh, somebody came after us, the hostile takeover. Those were the Milken days at the time. By the way, Mike Milken is a very close personal friend. Of, of mine, not through that, through other things. But anyhow, a couple of ex-managers of Aramark, together with Mike Milken, you know, came after us at the time, and we rebuffed them. This is 1984. At the same time, the 84 Olympics were going on. We had done an Olympic game since 1968 in Mexico City. That's when we started. So the 84 Olympics were in Los Angeles, as you recall. So we took the company private in 1984. We borrowed a billion dollars. I mean, literally, the front page of the Inquirer said 
billion dollar, I mean, that, it's amazing the number, you know, today, but in 1984, the headline underneath the words, the Philadelphia Inquirer says, ARA does billion dollar transaction. Well, I don't know about Brian, but I still think a billion dollars a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so, the fact that we took the company private again in 2007, it cost us $8 billion, a different story, but a billion dollars is still a lot of money. But in any event, we stayed public, uh, private for 17 years. So we finally went public again in 2001, so we're getting ready to, to go public, and. As you may know, you can't decide on Monday that you want to go public on Thursday. It takes quite a while to prepare for it and get ready for it, et cetera. So we started in the spring, and we've been chasing this one company called Service Master, actually a big division of Service Master, for about eight years. And we've been romancing three CEOs on the other side, et cetera, et cetera. They get a new CEO, and uh, he comes to us in summertime of uh, 2001 and says, I've made a decision, I've got to decide which part of my company I'm going to keep, and I'm going to keep the one that deals with the home, and I'm going to sell the one that deals with institutions. I'm going to have a limited auction. I'd like you to be one of the people bidding for it. I said, well, we're about to go public. We don't have time, and it takes a lot of stuff, and how about waiting six months until we're public, and then we'll talk to you about it. Oh, no, he says, no, I got to do it now because I got all the other things. So if you don't want to, that's fine. Oh, no, no, we want to. So we start scrambling to get that done. And uh, there's an auction going on. And uh, at the same time, I happen to be in Europe with my wife uh, on a business vacation. And there's also the opening at the time of the uh, Jewish Museum in Berlin. And we're there for the official opening. And it's a Monday morning. It's the party is Sunday night. It's Monday morning in September. Uh, and September 10th, I say I'm going home on Monday because I have somebody coming from overseas. And I've got to be there on the 11th. She stays with her parents because there's another private party by the executive director uh, at the time, Michael Blumenthal, uh, the former secretary of the treasury. And September 11th comes, and of course, she never makes it back home. She turns around in the middle of the flight, and her parents go to two different places. And we have uh, operations at the World Trade Center in both towers, and we lose seven people during that period of time, and we don't know where they are, and we don't know where our people are. We had 150 people working on both towers. Uh, but we organize ourselves. By Wednesday, we have emergency uh, teams on the ground. Uh, we operate Shea Stadium. That became a headquarters for the fire department. We operated uh, Ellis Island at the time. That became, again, a... Uh, a a beachhead for the Marines uh, at the time. We operated a couple of hospitals in the city. But we get through that, and we still got to go public at the time, uh, and we got to finish this acquisition uh, at, at that same time. And uh, we got to borrow a billion dollars. I have a son who's in the, in the finance business. And again, Lawrence, uh, who went to Harriton High School here in in, uh, in Philadelphia, in Montgomery County. And then went to school and graduate school. Again, he's used to us doing all the things. And he was in finance. He was a young banker at Bankers Trust at the time. And when I showed him the commitment letter, it was a one-page letter commitment for a billion dollars, he was impressed. He wasn't impressed with a lot of other things. But that one-page one commitment. One-pager. Yeah, one-pager for a billion. That's pretty good. Yeah. For a billion dollars was, was pretty impressive. So we get that done. We get through. Uh, all uh, the other pieces, of course, Wall Street is in ruins. And we then become the first large public company, a company to go public on December 11th, 2001. And in between there, our son and daughter-in-law lose a baby. 
who uh, only lived for 10 days, had congenital heart problems. And the emotion and the personal stamina, and again, leadership is all about having positive traits and having a focus on what you need to do and being able to compartmentalize in your own mind the things that are very important. And being able to be a leader of the enterprise and separating that from your personal emotion. I don't mean ignoring them. Right. I really mean just separating them. Boxing it. But you can imagine the joy of the team of being public again and creating a lot of wealth for a lot of people. We've created a lot of wealth for hundreds of people out of what I call selling hot dogs and picking up dirty laundry. This is not high tech. This is not pharma. This is just regular doggy dog hard work. Execution, execution, execution. So the meal that you're served here, when you go to Citizen Park, the hawkers and the vendors and concession stand, you know, operators, are all our people. So you're the leader, you're standing there, uh, a young sergeant from the New York Police Department sings God Bless America. You've walked through the ruins of downtown Manhattan and you're about to bury your grandson. And as a celebration for going public, you go and hold a luncheon for the 14 people that survived the disaster of 9-11, one of whom had burns on 85% of his body. That's how you create culture in the company. It's by what you do and the things that you lead that are important. So we didn't hold a party. We didn't give out a lot of favors. We just held a quiet luncheon with the top 20 leaders of the company honoring 12 people who survived 9-11. And you can do all that and then go up and comfort your children because that's another part of your life. So I admire leaders who are able to live the value system that they believe in, have a rich personal life, but don't confuse the two. So when leaders, and that's the issue of with, unfortunately, American youth that admire, you know, sports leaders or Hollywood leaders or other leaders who confuse personal life and public life, you know, together. So I give people a lot of space on their personal life. Have to note that every time I've ever seen you for 20 some years, you have a flag lapel on your, in your jacket. And to think you're standing there at ground zero and looking out not too far to the Statue of Liberty, which you saw when you came into the harbor for the first time. And why don't we see if there's any questions here in the audience or anybody who'd like to kind of ask Joe, have a thought or a question or a comment or anything like that. Anybody out there would like to, uh, to talk to Joe Neubauer tonight? Arthur, anything you'd like to kind of prime the pump for us here? Um, I actually do. I would just... Oh, okay. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Caitlin Tabawada, and I am a sophomore nursing major here at Widener University. Um, thank you for speaking tonight, by the way. It's a very lovely dinner. And my question to you is, do you have any pieces of advice that you could offer the students that are here tonight from Widener University about how we can improve on our leadership skills or anything that we could take away from this dinner? 
Well, the, the only piece of advice that, that I can give you is find a dream and follow it. But don't talk about it. Just go do it. And don't expect to succeed in everything that you try and do. You know, resilience is really the most important part of success. It's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get up that's really important. And, and success doesn't come by doing something once. It comes by doing the same thing over and over and over again and perfecting it. You know, I used to uh, marvel again when I was learning English when I was a kid. I used to listen to Edward R. Morrow. That's how I got some diction. And then I used to listen to Jack Benny just to get the lines right, etc. Yeah. And, you know, they used to deliver those lines, and I thought they were off the cuff. They were not off the cuff at all. They were practice, practice, practice. So find something that you're passionate about, that interests you, and then just go do it. Exercise it. And don't let it, don't let the first or the third or the fifth failure stop you. Thank you. Great. Anyone else? Any? Look back. Yes, back there, yeah. Tom Bound, Classic 6 and 7. Sure. So I spend most of my time worrying about the team. Uh, because, you know, you, people talk about strategy and people talk about innovation and invention, et cetera. Uh, I worry about teams. I worry about leadership teams. Because I think most institutions uh, are led by teams. It's never one person. It's very rarely more than 10 persons, somewhere in between. So look for the traits. So the team has to be, have to have a mix of skills, but the most, to me, some most important traits that the team has to have is a passion for what they're doing. They have to love what they're doing. If they just look at it as a job, it just doesn't cut it because it takes too much of a real leader to look at it just as something to do, a job. It's never a job. It's got to be a passion. To me, I think they have to be, understand human behavior and really appreciate other people. Uh, leadership, while it's solitary, at, at the top particularly, because decision making is very tough, and by the way, I never spend a lot of time worrying about what's right or wrong to me. Those things are fairly straightforward when you look at them at the time. They have nuances, but I've never really worried about it, whether I've done the right thing or the wrong thing. I always try to do the right thing, almost irrespective of the consequences. So passion, leadership, uh, I talk about resiliency, people who really commit to things and can get up again and keep doing it and are not negative. And people are fun. You know, at the end of the day, you want to work with a team that is fun to work with, people you want to, you want to be with. That doesn't mean you have to socialize with them. It doesn't mean you have to play golf with them all the time. But when you work and you solve hard problems, you're going to be able every so often to laugh at yourself and say, you know, we will overcome this. You know, have, people have positive thinking. You know, as, go back to resiliency as a real important trait. They don't have to be the smartest people in the world, by the way. You know, the old joke about the Harvard that the, you know, A's work for the B's who are owned by the C's, you know, all that <laughs> stuff. But, you, you know, 
the world is full of a lot of very bright people who don't get a lot of things done. But, you know, having a passion and getting things done and coming back again and again and getting it right, it's pretty amazing. Look, just look at Steve Jobs, you know, got kicked out of a job, you know, had to come back, you know, tried things over and over and over again. People told me couldn't succeed, stuff will never work. Came back. Did, didn't stay down. And on and on. Uh, many, many times. People told us when we first took the company private, our own lawyer said to me, you know, it's not a good thing you're doing. You're putting an apple on top of your head and you're inviting everybody to shoot at you. You might get hurt. It's true, I might have. But you've got to be courageous enough to say, okay, if I do that, I'll figure out somewhere to scramble. Which we did. In the middle of going private, at the time, we got a couple of offers from people who wanted to help us. Yeah, one of them was from Philadelphia, and one of them for, was from across the pond. And, uh, you know, I learned how to say no for three hours. Different variations of no. <laughs> but, you know, the answer is, you know, we're not interested. If you want to make a bid for the company, it's your pri privilege, you know. We don't have to work for you. You can come to the shareholders whenever you want to. Be my guest, but, you know, we like to do it ourselves. So it's very, very important to work with a team that you have confidence in. Uh, so that's, that's, those are the important part to me that I look for the team. And I, look, I've been disappointed too. Uh, less than 100% of the people that I appointed succeeded. And I always consider part of that when they don't succeed, whether they leave voluntarily or we ask them to leave, Part of it's my failure, either in selection or in training or in motivation. It's, uh, it's not just theirs. And again, you just got to, people accuse me of being too hard on myself, uh, which is true. But, uh, so I hold myself to very high standards. Uh, but it can't be 100%. It never is. So you take over the company, it's a billion five in sales. What's the sales now, Joe? Uh, about 12 and a half billion. Okay. Anyway, um, okay, 800%. Anyway, <laughs> let's take one more question. Yeah, Jack? Yeah, Joe, great job. It's Jack, just for me, my help, and all your Thank you. Uh, terrific, terrific stuff. Obviously, in the next couple of weeks, months, and in fact, going back sometime, we could talk a lot about moral courage and moral compass of organizations, whether you start with Enron, you talk about Allegheny, you talk about Penn State, and there are great people and great leaders in all of those organizations, but somewhere along the way, the moral courage and the moral compass got lost. So what I would ask you to share with us is how do you, as a CEO and a chairman of a large organization, uh, where you admitted that not everybody is gonna have it right, how do you make sure you keep that moral compass aligned in the right direction, and the moral courage uh, front and center? I think that's a great question, uh, Jack. And I asked myself, again, with my senior team, day before yesterday, whether something like that could happen to us, because you worry about your own organization. That happened to you. And I think that the incidents that we read about or hear about are not the first incidents that happen along the way of breakdowns in, 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 in values. It's a build up or build down, depending how you want to look at it, over a longer period of time. So it's just like in policing. You've got to start with the neighborhood. You've got to start with the broken windows. You've got to exhibit a consistent set of behaviors over a long period of time. So for example, at Aramark, we've had 
a business conduct policy committee before Sarbanes-Oxley ever existed. We've had it for 20 years when we're a private company. And it's run by the, by the heads of the businesses along with the CFO and the general counsel. I don't sit on it. Every infraction, and we've had, you know, anonymous phone lines, we've had business conduct training, we have certificates that everybody had to sign before all this became codified by, 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 by the government. And every one of these uh, incidents gets written up and investigated by the internal audit guys in the general counsel's office. And then these cases come before this committee, and the committee meters out you know, what they think is the right punishment, all the way from warning letters to you know, the extreme firing, and in between turning people over to the authorities when we find out that you know, they took the books for inventory or they took you know, $150 or $150,000. And by the way, we have all of that happening to us. But you have to exhibit a consistent set of behaviors. And, uh, and you have to have the moral courage to stand up and to say, here's what we're going to do. You know, we've had to let go some very senior people that we hated to let go because they had a failure of judgment at certain times, whether there was at a social party where they might have drank too much and did something that they wish they hadn't, or where they deliberately over a period of time did something because one of the children had a problem and they needed some money, or they had a girlfriend, or, you know, all sorts of things happen when you have as many people as we have. But I think it's the consistency of behavior that gives the organization the moral compass and the courage to stand up and say, this is wrong. And that's the thing that personally, well, I know that at Enron, I know because I know some people there, and uh, I know what happened. So remember, they staged all sorts of things. For investors, when they came in, they brought people in. I mean, there was a whole charade going on for a long time. I don't know what went on at the academic institution in, in institution in Pennsylvania. I think we will find out, going on, but I, my guess is that this was not one set of incidents that happened. There's lots and lots of other stuff that was going on there to, uh, to support that. And people, lots of people look the other way, and that just doesn't work. That's what all of us as directors, and somebody talked about it earlier, uh, have to worry about. And that's why when we become trustees or directors of institutions and we lend our name to the institution, why well, it's very important. You know, my definition of independent directors, you know, the, it's all SEC and definition and there is a New York Stock Exchange definition. I have a much simpler definition. To me, an independent director is one whom the institution needs more than she or he needs the institution. It's very simple. If you can't stand up and speak your mind at a board meeting and not worry about whether your fellow directors are not going to like you or not, you can't be a jerk. I mean, politely, if you can't stand up and say, here's what I think, and run the risk that the CEO or the lead director or four directors are not going to like you and they're going to kick you out, then you shouldn't be there. So it's that consistency that, uh, that you've got to build up over a long period of time. That's great, Joe. Thank you so much. Really appreciate Pleasure. it. Pleasure.